Well, good evening, church history friends. My name is Barb Walden, and I am thrilled to once again welcome you back to the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation's Spring Lecture Series. Uh, tonight is the final lecture in our Spring Lecture Series. Also, as you hear me say every week, donations from tonight's program support the preservation and maintenance of Community of Christ Historic Sites. Uh, the sites are closed for the rest of the 2021 year due to COVID-19, but the preservation and maintenance of the historic sites continues on. Your donations are critical at this time as the loss of revenue from site preservation fees and museum store sales over the past year is unprecedented. So as we continue to work towards the goal of becoming self-sustaining at the historic sites, your donations from tonight's lecture will help support and preserve Community of Christ historic sites for present and future generations. If um, you would like to make an online donation, Dalen has dropped the donations address uh, for both the online and mail-in donations in the chat box. Uh, thank you all for your generous support as we strive to preserve church heritage. And now for the heart of the evening, our lecture with Professor Howlett. David Howlett is the Mellon Visiting Assistant Professor of Religion at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Uh, Dr. Howlett earned a BSc from the University of Central Missouri, an MA from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and a PhD from the University of Iowa. He is a specialist in American religions and has taught at Kenyon College, Skidmore College, and Bowdoin College. His published works include Kirtland Temple, the biography of a shared Mormon sacred space, a book that we know really well after the summer book series. And he co-authored Mormonism, The Basics, which was published in 2017. David is one of three official historians for Community of Christ, and he holds the priest priesthood office of elder. I'll turn the microphone over to you, David, as we are ready to hear all about F.M. Smith the Atherton Community, and American Communal Experiments. Thank you, Barb. It's good to share again, and uh, thank you for all the folks who showed up tonight and for your patience for being rescheduled um, from earlier in June. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and show you some of the best part of tonight, which is the pictures, a <laughs> PowerPoint presentation. So if you're not into what I'm saying, look at the pictures. They are fantastic. These are archival materials from Community Christ Archives with the Atherton uh, community itself. So here it is, the first title slide. I'll go from the beginning. So F.M. Smith, The Atherton Community, and American Communal Utopian Experiments. On Resurrection Sunday, April 1930, Bishop J.A. Kaler of the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints attended a priesthood prayer meeting at the Stone Church RLDS congregation in Independence, Missouri. After a week of solemn and joyful conference services, remembering the past 100 years of the denomination's history, men from across the world sat seeking the Lord's further direction before Easter services. Kaler rose to his feet and dramatically declared a vision he had been given. Quote, I saw Jesus, he proclaimed, not Jesus the man, but Jesus the way, the truth, and the life, crucified on a cross of gold. Using language from social gospel Christianity, Kaler explained that he had seen Jesus, quote, lying in a tomb of acquisitive institutions, bound by grave cloths of exploitative customs, and sealed in a tomb by the stone of ignorance and selfishness under a new imperial authority, capitalistic private interest. Dejected saints wept for their dead Lord. Greed and capitalism had won the day, so it seemed. Yet out of grief and despair, Kaler envisioned a great commotion that woke the dead Lord from the grave. Representing the angel of God, RLDS priesthood members rolled the rock away from the entrance to the tomb. As Jesus came forth from the tomb, Kaler saw not a physical body, but an incarnational Lord, a social gospel Lord, found in, quote, the institutions of mutual helpfulness and clothed with divine understanding, unquote. 
Through RLDS cooperative organizations and education, Kaler believed that he saw the resurrection of Christ. Kaler's incarnational Lord became, quote, the word made flesh in the city of Zion. According to Kaler, Zion, the RLDS model community that embodied Christ, would become an ensign to the world. The, quote, eyes of the nations would be transfixed upon, transfixed upon the saints' community. Triumphantly, Kaler proclaimed that the embodiment of Christ in Zion provided the rest of the world with true, authentic life. Quote, he is risen, declared the nations, and because he lives, we too shall live. Through his Easter morning vision, Bishop Kaler embodied the contradictions and hopes of his movement in modernity. Reorganized Latter-day Saints, referred to by Jan Ships as the Prairie Saints, were in the process of modernizing their denomination, moving slowly towards what some sociologists in the 1920s identified as a sect to denomination transformation. Church leaders like Bishop Kaler freely drew on social gospel theologians and progressive social thought for their articulation of their very particularistic Latter-day Saint vision of the kingdom of God that RLDS members believe would be built as a physical community in Jackson County, Missouri. As the culmination of several years of planning by church members in hierarchy, like Bishop Kaler, specially chosen RLDS stewards were ordained and established a small community at Atherton, Missouri in an effort to bring forth this kingdom on earth. As Kaler's vision indicated, early 20th century RLDS members equated their actions with God's work in the world. Without their effort, God's kingdom would have no place on the earth. Ever confident in their ability to perfect their bodies and live in perfect harmony, RLDS members espoused an optimistic community praxis that they believed could resurrect humanity itself. Yet in the months to come after Kaler's April 8, 18, 1930 vision, RLDS members endured a series of losses that seemed to take on the dimensions of, a, of the death of a beloved one. Armed with a theology that believed in the ability of chosen special bodies to overcome all things, RLDS members could not foresee the emotional, financial, and physical losses that they would endure during the Great Depression. For some, such losses would lead to a broader, spiritualized reinterpretation of Zion, while others would emphasize some of the apocalyptic aspects of the kingdom over its socialistic economic vision. While to the present day ob observers, maybe the saints community building dreams could seem curious or even a little naive, beliefs such as these were anything but strange for the 1930s. Individuals of varied persuasions experimented in communal living in massive collectivized programs throughout the decade. In Canada, ordinary Catholics experimented with the Antigonish movement. Radical Catholic and ex-communist Dorothy Day founded the communally-based Catholic worker movement in American cities. Eastern European Jewish immigrants founded a kibbutz, the Sunrise Colony near Saginaw, Michigan, while urban New Jersey Jewish garment workers started a triple cooperative community that combined agricultural, industrial, and retail cooperatives all in one community. The latter experiment, the, named the Jersey Homesteads, was one of 99 New Deal new towns that collectively received $109 million of federal assistance from various New Deal agencies. Even the arch critic of Utopian Ventures, Reinhold Niebuhr, served on the board of directors of a several thousand acre interracial farming cooperative in the Deep South. RLDS members then stood with these disparate others in their dreams of building collectivized communities that would solve world problems and usher in a reign of peace. Now, the RLDS vision for a collectivized utopian communities found expression in the symbol of Zion, which RLDS equated with the kingdom of God on earth. Early 20th century RLDS beliefs on Zion were a syncretic amalgamation of 19th century Latter-day Saint uh, thought found in Latter-day Saint scripture, Protestant social gospel ideals that were current at the time, and some of even what we might call muscular Christianity from the early 20th century. Always more open to Protestant theology than their LDS cousins, early 20th century RLDS leaders liberally borrowed from thinkers as diverse as the social gospel theologian Walter Rauschenbusch, pragmatist philosopher John Dewey, radical theologian Harry Ward, 
sociologist and theologian Charles Elwood, uh, the, the Anglican Archbishop of Canterbury, um, uh, William Temple, and the eminent American psychologist and advocate of muscular Christianity, G. Stanley Hall, who was the PhD advisor to Fred M. Smith. To build Zion, our LDS leaders urged their people to become acquainted with such diverse, challenging thinkers. Paradoxically, our LDS leaders and laity juxtaposed the use of such liberal leaders with a rather conservative conviction that the then 100,000 member RLDS church was the one true church and the true heirs of Joseph Smith Jr.'s restoration movement. Like their 19th century ancestors, many members felt millennial urgency to build the kingdom on earth through cooperative colonies. And you can see that through the visions and dreams that they share in the early 20th century and share in prayer services and share in books. Similarly, our earliest saints taught a doctrine of gathering to build up this kingdom. Following Joseph Smith Jr.'s revelations from the 1830s, our LDS believed that the new Jerusalem was to have literal physical place in Independence, Missouri. In accordance with Smith's 19th century revelations, the RLDS hierarchy relocated their church headquarters to Independence in 1920, and many leaders had moved there um, a decade earlier. Joseph Smith Jr.'s radical egalitarianism, too, was to find place in the RLDS kingdom. In Zion, quote, every man who has need may amply be amply supplied and received according to his wants, revealed the first Latter-day Saint prophet. The early 20th century RLDS prophet, Frederick Madison Smith, like to sum up his grandfather Joseph Smith Jr.'s concept with the phrase, quote, from every man according to his capacity to every man according to his needs. And of course, President F.M. Smith directly drew this felicitous phrase from Karl Marx. <laughs> so while Joseph Smith, John Dewey, and Karl Marx may have been uh, strange bedfellows, at least in a sense to outsiders they looked in that way, our earliest leaders saw no contradiction in their religious syncretism. The glory of God is intelligence, declared Joseph Smith Jr. in a Thus Saith the Lord Revelation, and our LDS members believed it, albeit with new modern minds. Historian Mario de Pilis argues that this restoration scriptural passage, the glory of God is intelligence, meant primarily education in millennial doctrine in personal holiness to early Latter-day Saints. Yet, as the saints accommodated to the secular world, intelligence came to mean the cultivation of the mind. Early 20th century RLDS wholeheartedly pursued such cultivation. Like their LDS cousins, RLDS members pursued paths towards establishing higher educational institutions and advanced degrees from America's best colleges and universities. Quote, one's knowledge of Zion, wrote President and Prophet F.M. Smith, quote, would be enhanced by knowing as much as possible of the humanities in scientific study anthropology to know man as a biological individual, ethnology to know him as one of a group, psychology to know him of his mental traits, sociology to know the fruitage of social instincts. All this should widen the scope of his knowledge of the Zionic goals. Of course, F.M. Smith took this counsel to heart too and earned an MA in sociology in 1911 and a PhD in social psychology in 1916. Early 20th century RLDS members longed for learning and a chance to practice applied Christianity, advocated both by prophets and liberal Protestant social gospel leaders. Armed with a strangely conservative or sectarian and proto-ecumenical theology, RLDS members embraced their perceived duty and destiny to establish communities of cooperation that would usher in the kingdom of God. By 1929, RLDS Saints had established a number of stewardship associations whose ends were to establish cooperative communities. RLDS laity and leaders formed at least four communal efforts located in Atherton, Missouri, Onset, Massachusetts, Detroit, Michigan, and Taney County, Missouri. Atherton was the oldest of the efforts and was the culmination of years of planning on the part of RLDS officials. By 1926, RLDS church leaders had bought almost 2,500 acres of land in the Atherton floodplain along the Missouri River, just to the north and east of Independence, Missouri. By 1930, as many as 19 families occupied small houses in the startup community. The saints at Atherton built a church, they farmed, 
began a poultry hatchery, which for a time brought in profit for the community that was equally divided among all stewards. And here's a map of the community from, there was at least what it was proposed and some of it was built. Unfortunately for the stewards who occupied the small startup communities, larger national and denominational disasters intervened to help bring about the end of the experiments. And that was just as they were kind of only getting off the ground. In early 1931, our earliest leaders realized that the church faced a serious financial crisis with the construction of a, of a gigantic green domed headquarters conference center in Independence, Missouri. That's the auditorium, of course. <laughs> the RLDS church accumulated a debt of $1,876,000. And that's of course in 1930s dollars. To preserve the financial solvency of the RLDS church, leaders would have to take drastic measures. In desperation, RLDS prophet F.M. Smith visited the struggling stewardship community at Atherton and asked the stewards to mortgage the church owned land to help in a church wide financial retrenchment program. Quote, well, President Smith, do you know what this means to this project? Asked a steward. Well, hmm, it means the game is up. Well, we're sorry, but the church is in a tight spot and we just have to do it. That's a quote from F.M. Smith. Atherton stewards have become seriously divided in the previous months over issues of leadership and control in their small community. With Smith's announcement of the land's mortgage, the formal stewardship community broke apart. Several stewards remained on the Atherton land and individually rented from the church, while the RLDS bishopric sold several cooperative enterprises and parcels of land to outside buyers, some of whom were not RLDS members. So like other groups in, Ather in modernity, RLDS members faced the disconfirmation of their hopes of building a religious utopia in the 1930s. Predictably, RLDS members cited many reasons for the failure of their community. The land was never free from debt, told Bishop Kaler to an interviewer in the RLDS bishopric. There had been an unwise use of spiritual gifts in the past, asserted Atherton pastor Amos E. Allen, who cited how steward D.R. Hughes had been told in prophecy that Hughes would be a bishop. As a result, Allen believed that Hughes had difficulty cooperating with church authorities due to this unwise prophetic message. Frankie Ford felt that the community had failed due to a lack of prophetic insight by those who called the stewards to their tasks. So they didn't call the right people to the task. <laughs> According to O.C. Hughes, quote, the causes of the discontinuance were all of a spiritual and intangible nature and that none of them were due to financial difficulties. So he thought the community itself was doing just fine. In contrast, other stewards felt that the community had relied too much on divine intervention. Steward Roy Young stated that the same attitude was taken by some of these men that was taken in connection with other farm problems, being superficially that they should pray over their problems and that the Lord would rebuke the disease from their flocks, the same as he would rebuke the disease from people on administration and that the Lord would lead them in various endeavors. And Young concluded that the Atherton community had been, quote, too narrow, too selfish, too clannish, and not inclined to look upon the entire needs of the community. That's rather frank talk, of course. Now, while Atherton stewards were shaken by this experience, each reaffirmed their faith in what they called the cause of Zion. That's, of course, language from the RLDS Doctrine and Covenants. Quote, Brother Edgerton said that he was not discouraged with the attempt to build stewardships, noted interviewer Bishop Earl Higdon in a report compiled for RLDS leaders in 1940. Quote, he hoped that the time would come when the general church would study and present a program which it could sanction. Higdon reported that steward Roy Young, quote, had not lost faith in the stewardship idea and believes that someday men and women of the church shall have arrived at the point of broad-mindedness and tolerance when they can work together in the establishment of a stewardship community. Despite the sometimes harsh feelings among former stewards in the project, every man, and they were all men <laughs> that were interviewed, um, so every man interviewed felt that the stewardships could succeed in the future. Atherton had been a learning experience for the church upon which others could build, uh, at least so the folks who were interviewed thought. Taken within the context of their time, the stewards at Atherton acted in culturally understandable ways on hopes shared by more than simply their own religious group. We kind of went over some of the collective um, endeavors that were present in the 1930s that were 
went far across outside the lines of simply the RLDS church, of course. In the period after the failure of their community, members reaffirmed their faith in the RLDS church, or at least the ideals of the church. And I just wanted to share with you um, this particular evangelistic flyer from the 1920s um, that RLDS missionaries were passing out. And you can see the restored gospel will be presented by the name of the elder at this place and time. Um, and then it says the Latter-day Saint program. If you read it, this is kind of what they're interpreting in the 1920s as the restored gospel. It says social reform by individual re regeneration, every man having opportunity to be his best, to do his best for the good of all, love the dynamic, righteousness the principle, justice the basis of social relationship. That seems pretty individualistic, social reform by individual regeneration. This gets more communally minded. It keeps on going on to organize such men and women into the kingdom of God, to provide all the suitable means which with their talents become their stewardships, each one being brought to the task he is able to perform, the product to be distributed so that none has less than is needed and no one has more than he can use. <laughs> that is the restored gospel in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, so just wanted to point out that's kind of a, a, a vision for what it meant to talk about the restored gospel in this time period. Well, so all of the members of this period of time reaffirm somehow their faith in the gospel plan of stewardships, um, even if some of them became somewhat bitter at some of the RLDS hierarchy, like F.M. Smith or Bishop Kaler, who they saw as meddling uh, in the affairs a little too much of their community. Members of the RLDS church in general were very disappointed by the failure of the Atherton community. The April 1930 um, conference a commemorative book includes a really big spread on the Atherton community with photographs and an article on it right in the very center of this commemorative book. So it was being titled as a, a real answer, a concrete example of Zion that could emerge in the near future. So it was a great disappointment for the RLDS church at large. So um, nonetheless, RLDS members were not simply connected to the notion of like, we're going to build Zion. If it fails, then it all falls apart. And that, that, that's true. That's important to them. But let's think of them that, that this idea of Zion is connected to a matrix of other things too. It's connected to a cosmology rooted in Old and New Testament symbols and reinterpreted by modern RLDS scripture, regularly given through RLDS church prophets from Joseph Smith Jr. to the present. And RLDS members tied some of the reason for being beyond just the the failure of this community or not to social services that they also advocated for in the early 20th century, a deep sense of calling, interpersonal bonds, sacred communal rituals, and evangelism as part of their purpose for being a people. So what I'm saying is like, we can frame this as there's a failure of a community, the community is going to break apart. Well, there's more to hold the community together, together than just this idea, this failure of this one communal experiment that goes awry. So in the years that followed the dissolution of the Atherton experiment, our earliest leaders continued to preach the doctrine of Zion, but they never again ventured church ties to start new communities. Instead, you saw individual members starting grassroots Zionic experiments that ranged from small loan organizations to cooperative grocery stores to small communities where members lived together in neighborhoods. And you can see that um, the result of that still in places like, well, I mean, there was one in the Seattle area and one in Apple Valley, Minnesota, and one in okay, Harvest Hills in basically Blue Springs, Missouri. So but those are more grassroots efforts, which had some church blessing, but the church wasn't fronting the money for all of these things in that way, as it did with the Atherton experiment. But I also want to point out that in these other experiments, Atherton was about growing crops. It was about literally agricultural production. And Zion became less of a utopia of production in these latter versions than a utopia of consumption. Meaning like a lot of the ways that people try to resist the system, if you will, today is through consumption. Think about it, how people eat, what they buy, it's consumption or consumption. So I, I think this is showing a shift, a larger shift in Western perceptions of perfected future communities in the second half of the 20th century between this kind of older model of production and this newer model of uh, uh, ethical consumption. By the 1960s, 
our LDS members who sought Zion had to contend with a new conflict in their church, the clear emergence of a deepening chasm between fundamentalist and modernist factions. That's an early 20th century phrasing of it. You can also say between um, conservative and progressive factions. And while these debates simmered under the surface uh, in, among ecclesiastical conflicts in the 1920s, our LDS members held these two worldviews in tension. Yet by the late 1960s, individuals in the RLDS church had begun to self-identify themselves as either liberals or fundamentalists. And the language of fundamentalism was self-consciously chosen by the more conservative members. Elsewhere, I've argued that this fundamentalist liberal split was due in part to the difficult American transformation from what Robert Withnow calls dwelling spirituality to seeker spirituality. This move was due in part to the larger societal reorganizations in America, in America since World War II. According to Withnow, and this is kind of a classic work by now, is after heaven I'm highlighting here, that I'm taking these arguments from. So according to Withnow, family and personal lives were organized in new ways, causing Americans to negotiate and live with confusion. In addition, people of other faiths were forced to interact with each other, to band together, to compromise, and to bargain with other religious groups to get what they wanted. Our LDS members, not immune from their environments, were caught in these larger cultural dynamics that helped generate two very different ways of being in their church, seeking and dwelling, if you will. Yet on the localized level, the RLDS collective reckoning with their vision of Zion also helped generate this fundamentalist liberal chasm. So what I'm trying to say is it's not simply that in America, post-World War II, there's these clearly kind of aligned liberal and conservative camps in American religion. That happens in the RLDS church too, but I'm saying it's also a localized problem of people thinking about what is Zion also is manifest in both these kinds of ways of progressive and conservative. And that grappling with that problem is one of the kinds of like other ways in which this kind of chasm develops within the RLDS church. So while the first generation of RLDS hierarchy never repudiated its commitment to a combined, you might say, early Latter-day Saint and progressive model for Zion, um, the second generation of RLDS progressives dropped the more sectarian trappings of Zion for an ecumenical model of the kingdom drawn from modernist theology that affirmed broad responsibility over society instead of over one centralized geographical area. Zion in this new conceptualization was to be 11 in the world rather than a lighthouse, which is a classic kind of analogy taken from this actual book in 1973 by several very prominent RLDS leaders and apostles and folks in the first presidency. So there's a few RLDS leaders that even admitted that the goal of building a utopian city, a gathered city, was impossible for humans to achieve. That was Jeff Spencer. <laughs> so to compensate for this bold admission, progressives emphasize a realized eschatology that affirmed that Zion was already and still not yet. You can actually see that in some of Jeff Spencer's hymns even. A process rather than a goal. Still, church progressives emphasize the need to make Zion present through social justice advocacy and participatory human development projects in all the world. Progressives then spiritualize Zion while still affirming a commitment to concrete social justice issues attached to the great Western liberal project. In contrast, fundamentalists reinterpreted Zion in a way that denied any reinterpretation needed to take place. Church members simply needed to follow God's eternal word, keep the commandments, and the kingdom would come, so they claimed. After the collapse of the Atherton community um, in 1931, many former stewards became resentful of hierarchical control by educated experts like Bishop Kaler and F.M. Smith. This resentment presaged a later revolt against ecclesiastical experts by the next generation of Atherton residents. As noted before, many former stewards remained at Atherton and rented from the RLDS church, raising families on the land that they hoped would someday again bring forth the seed of the kingdom. Perhaps predictably in the age of Cold War containment, the 1950s to the early 1970s, the children of Atherton stewards lost much of their parents' Christian socialism, but retained their conservative eschatological hopes for the future. So some of these children who stayed in Atherton eventually revolted against attempts by the RLDS hierarchy to allow for the ordination of women in the 1980s 
within their stake. So if you're outside of the RLDS kind of world, a stake is like a diocese. They sued for the ownership of the Atherton Church building itself that the stewards had built, and they won ownership of the building. Today, the Atherton Restoration Branch is an independent congregation affiliated with the Conference of Restoration Elders, a group that is part of the larger milieu of restorationists who are heavily influenced by traditional RLDS theology mixed with contemporary Protestant evangelicalism and conservative American politics. I think that's um, very present in contemporary restorationist kinds of uh, theology and sermons and talks and sources they cite. And they're very much a part of also kind of adjacent to the evangelical world. These self-described fundamentalists, at least they were self-described fundamentalists in the 1980s, then adapted their vision of Zion by reaffirming basic faith commitments, even while they downplayed the radical socialism of Zion to fit within the politics of the American religious right. Now, in sum, the failure to build Zion in the 1930s was not simply an issue worked out by one generation of believers, like folks in the 1930s, but a problem that individuals confronted across generational lines. Additionally, RLDS members struggled with this problem within the context of complex changes in American society across 40 years. RLDS members confronted new spiritual languages, new cultural chasms, and new conceptions of the good society. For each rising generation, part of Zion died. Here I'm trying to circle back to Bishop Kaler's vision. Okay, that's what I'm trying to do here. For each rising generation, part of Zion died. Yet RLDS faithful resurrected the dead corpse in divergent reinterpretations of their collective prophecy that in turn preserved the integrity of their spiritual cosmos in a changing world. In the end, I think the last, world, the last word of this talk must be given to the stewards, the people who attempted to create a Zionic community through working together in Atherton. Reflecting back on their community experiences in the twilight of their lives, former stewards drafted and signed a statement in 1979 on the history of the Atherton project. They concluded their work with these with this following quote that I have here, haunting yet hopeful words. Those who were engaged in the partnership forming endeavor experienced the greatest period of fellowship of their lives. It formed a lasting tie between them and they maintained their hope in Zion as long as they lived. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. Uh, the Atherton community story is an interesting one, but then to hear the the historic context around it makes it an all, all the more fascinating story. So thank you for, for sharing what you know about Atherton. Can't say that we're ready to start our own communal experiment quite yet, but you have certainly given us a lot to think about before we do. Keep in mind that tonight's lecture was a part of the spring lecture series and all of the lectures from the series were recorded and are available on our website and YouTube channel. So if you happen to have missed a lecture, uh, you could just head over to our website and check it out. In addition, our friends over at Project Zion are continuing to interview our speakers from the spring series. Who knows, David Howlett could be their next interview. You will find links to the interviews that are currently available on our lecture series webpage and at the Project Zion podcast website. Uh, we hope to see you all again next week as we gather to discuss Matthew Bolton's book, Apostle of the Poor, The Life and Work of Missionary and Humanitarian Charles D. Neff. Uh, that's going to be a fantastic uh, conversation, so I encourage you to register. Dalen has already dropped the link to the summer book series in the chat box. Be sure to follow that link to register for the August 12th and 19 discussions. And lastly, I want to give you a glimpse at what's in store for the fall lecture series. Uh, although David Howlett is wrapping up the spring lecture series tonight, we're already thinking about what's happening this fall. Uh, maybe it's the cooler weather that we're most interested in. Um, but I want to give you a glimpse of what to expect. Since we won't be heading out on an annual bus tour this year due to COVID-19, we will be traveling the world virtually through a series of awesome online lectures this October and November. Uh, registration details are headed your way soon, but here's some of the things you can expect. Richard James is gonna tell us all about the history of the church in Wales. 
Andrew Bolton and Philip Caswell will think back about their experience with Kasuki Sakini and his wife Saku. Uh, they'll share Kasuki's story and uh, about the contributions that Kasuki made to Community of Christ, both in Japan and all over the world. It'll be a great lecture. In addition, we'll welcome Christelle Vanel, who will tell us the history of the church in France. Ben Smith from Australia will tell us all about church history in Australia. And Eva Erickson and Kristen Jeske will join us and share a little bit about church history in 20th century Germany. That'll be a great one. Peter Gaffney will tell us all about Community of Christ history in England. And registration details, of course, are coming soon. So keep an eye on your inbox and on Facebook and Instagram. We'll be sure to uh, put up a link when registration is ready and available. But in the meantime, mark your calendars for uh, October 7th through November 18th, those Thursday nights, for more church history. Well, friends, until next time, I encourage you to keep reading your church history and have a blessed night. Thank you all.